As one of the most popular speed games from the golden age of speedrunning, our subject today hardly needs an introduction. A game that has weathered a storm of criticism and emerged a timeless gem on the other side. Our story takes us to the very heart and soul of what it means to be a speedrunner. This is the story of The Wind Waker. The characters featured here are some of the biggest personalities in speedrun history. The execution on display is second to none. The barriers in our way are monolithic. The nearly two decades of hard work that went into each and every discovery is unlike anything else we've ever encountered. If the endless dream of speedrun perfection guides your restless spirit, seize it. Raise your flag and join us. Welcome to Speed Ducks. Released on December 13th, 2002 for the Nintendo GameCube, The Wind Waker launched as the most ambitious Zelda title of its time. Sporting a new cel-shaded art style, an open ocean world, and a new cartoony Link, it was definitely a break from its predecessors. While controversial for its day, The Wind Waker's design decisions have helped this title withstand the test of time. Our journey begins on Outset Island, where Link sees the Helmarok King carrying a young girl in its talons. After being hit with a cannonball by a pursuing pirate ship, Link learns the girl's name is Tetra. The Helmarok King mistakes Link's younger sister Errol for Tetra and whisks her away. Link embarks on a quest to rescue his younger sister and discovers that all is not as it seems. Setting sail with some salty sailors, Link's journey brings him throughout the Great Sea. Whereas Ocarina of Time has time travel and Twilight Princess has wolf transformations, the Wind Waker features a map virtually covered in ocean. This sets the stage for many exciting hours of sailing gameplay. Link learns that Hyrule, the usual setting for Zelda titles, exists as a kingdom hidden deep beneath the seas after a great flood. After retrieving the Master Sword, Link is returned to the surface to find and reunite the Eight Shards of the Triforce of Courage, find new Earth and Wind Sages, and defeat Ganon. Link's voyage will take him from sea to shining sea, to 49 separate islands. These islands include, but are not limited to, Windfall Island, Dragon Roost Island, Forest Haven, Headstone Island, Gale Island, and many more. And of course, it would not be a Zelda game if there weren't any dungeons. Link will need to complete Dragon Roost Cavern, Forbidden Woods, Tower of the Gods, Forsaken Fortress, Earth Temple, Wind Temple, and Ganon's Tower. In Ganon's Tower, runners are going to have to fight three different Ganons. Phantom Ganon, Puppet Ganon, and Ganon Ganon. Timing stops when Link stabs the final Ganon in the face. Now without further ado, let's get started. If you've ever seen a speedrunning history video before, you probably have a good idea of where this story starts. Like so many other games, The Wind Waker's Journey starts on Speed Demos Archive, one of the oldest and largest speedrunning forums of all time. In classic fashion, the first person to truly delve into Wind Waker speedruns is none other than the legendary David Marshmallow Gibbons. One of the most prolific speedrunners of all time, Marsh made a name for himself by setting out to speedrun every game that he owned. 
Marsh held world records in dozens of games in the early 2000s, from Banjo-Kazooie to Luigi's Mansion. Marsh struck out to beat the Wind Waker in early 2005, just over two years after the game had come out. The game was still in its youth and didn't have a wealth of players looking for glitches or time saves. Needless to say, it was a little rough around the edges. As such, Marsh plays through the game intentionally, essentially playing as the developers intended. There were none of the hallmarks of most Zelda games, like sequence breaks, glitches, or skips. Marsh does attempt to use a technique called sail pumping, which involves constantly pulling out and putting away the sail to get a small speed boost as long as your wind direction is favorable. Unfortunately, the ways in which it was used in this run did not save any time. Whoops. After a grueling 18 segments, Marsh finally brings it home with a time of 7 hours, 8 minutes, and 32 seconds on January 30th, 2005. This run had all the crisp quality and performance expected of a Marshmallow run at the time, but the game had nowhere to go but up. Not too long after this run, infamous Zelda cheater TSA submitted a segmented run claiming to be almost 30 minutes faster than Marsh's. While it was originally accepted, all of TSA's runs have since been discredited due to several splices being discovered on a large number of his speedruns. If you're wondering how TSA spliced a segmented run, the answer is poorly. Over the next few years, several runners would make improvements to the run and further advance the fastest time. But as this was the early days of speedrunning, there is no video recording that exists today of any of those runs. The runners who did this were Unreal with a 640-23, Chimpus with a 627-14, and Marcus with a 617 minute time. Because of the long runtime for this game, interest dwindled in the full game run over the next few years. While there weren't any new records, there were still plenty of tricks and strategies being developed on the SDA forums. One of the earliest glitches that players were using was the Infinite Soup glitch. After leaving Outset Island, Link's grandma becomes ill. By bringing her a fairy, she becomes well again and offers Link a bottle of soup as a reward. This soup fully refills Link's hearts and magic and gives him a double damage boost until he gets hit again. By swapping the button that the bottle is on right when you go to use it, Link drinks the soup but doesn't consume the item. Using this, runners had access to essentially infinite health and magic refills, as well as double damage whenever they wanted. On top of this, runners also found plenty of smaller time savers like skipping the second phase of the Helmarok fight, found by Venek, and how to skip the mini-boss in Earth Temple. After four years without any new videos, we see a new record time set by runner Giano. While every full game run had been finished in multiple segments, Giano set out to marathon the entire game in one sitting. Putting his predecessors to shame, Giano set a new best time with a 6.16.29 in January of 2012. Oh, you're so fucking dead again. Right now you're dead, you're fucking dead! Say goodnight! Say goodnight! <laughs> What's your time, dude? Come on, man. 6.16. Jesus, dude, you're a fucking noob. <laughs> Giano's run is exceptional for a few reasons we can finally see all of the work that the community has been doing being put into a single run. But outside of the previously mentioned tricks, Giano's run also shows off one new major glitch, zombie hovering. Zombie hovers are an interesting glitch unique to the Wind Waker speedruns. Essentially, when Link's health goes to zero, there's a small window where Link can perform a jump slash. Because his health is zero, the game will cancel this jump slash after the first frame, and he'll fall to the ground and die. However, it's possible to perform another jump slash while falling, giving Link a small amount of height. By mashing the B button very quickly, Link can hover in the air and even gain height if players mash fast enough. The only major caveat to this glitch is that Link will die as soon as he touches the ground. However, by using the Tingle Tuner item, players can purchase a health refill on their Game Boy Advance, meaning Link is free to land after his ascension to the Great Beyond. Using Zombie Hovers in Dragon Roost Cavern and Forbidden Woods, Giano is able to skip parts of dungeons and reach normally impossible heights, saving himself decent chunks of time. 
Giano himself is also an interesting figure. Giano is one of the co-founders of the website Speed Runs Live, a hub dedicated to hosting races of various speed games. SRL came about at a time when people were spending more time talking about runs as opposed to actually playing the game. SRL was a simple and easy solution to get people playing the games and actually doing speedruns. Runners formed new communities as they played with other enthusiasts and shared strategies. It was a major culture shift from the forums on SDA. Starting in 2010, the Wind Waker saw regular races on SRL. Because the any percent category was so long, however, most runners opted to race just the first half of the game, either the first few dungeons or to the Master Sword. One of these regular racers was none other than the other site co-founder, Narcissa Wright. For speedrunners of a certain age, there are two pivotal figures that introduced them to speedrunning, Siglemic and Narcissa. She was quickly becoming the star of the speedrunning community, as she was proficient in a number of games, especially Zelda titles like Ocarina of Time and The Wind Waker. She was a talented gamer and a natural-born speedrunner. From getting second place at the Nintendo World Championship in 2015 to being a frequent runner on the GDQ stage, Narcissa made a name for herself as a top-notch player. So Narcissa was one of the biggest streamers on Twitch at the time. So just having that audience brought a lot of interest to the game. It brought runners to the game, so I know I found out about Wind Waker speedruns through her stream. After seeing Giano get into full game runs, Narcissa felt inspired to join in, along with another runner, Kafta. Giano had only done two attempts of the run, and Narcissa knew that there was still plenty of time to save. And while Giano also implemented most of the skips and tricks that had been discovered in the last few years, he opted to skip a very important glitch forest water storage. The water in the forest pond has special properties that will dissipate after 20 minutes of gameplay. When that timer runs out, the game will produce a text box to let you know that it's just regular water now. By timing it right, players could pull out the Wind Waker at the exact same time that the text appeared. Players are then able to move around like normal, but the game still thinks they're trying to play the Wind Waker. In this state, cutscenes won't start and Link can change his collision by opening a chest. While this trick is not easy to perform, it does provide some really interesting benefits. The one main use in speedruns, however, was to skip the cabana deed on Private Oasis. After getting forest water storage and then opening the chest, the game performs fewer collision checks on Link's hitbox. This allows players to partially clip into the side of the cabana and use the hookshot to pull themselves through the building. By interrupting the hookshot with a bomb explosion, players could knock themselves into the loading zone behind the door to skip the side quest required to enter the building. Kafta would get on the ball sooner and be the first to lower the record to a 6.03.53. The biggest difference between this run and Giano's is it's played on the Japanese version of the game. Like many other games, the Japanese text is more condensed, meaning there are significantly fewer characters that need to be written on screen. The text in both the Japanese and the English versions both scroll one character per frame, but because of the fewer characters overall, Japanese text saves 20 minutes over English. On the reverse side, however, the Japanese version includes an extra C-chart quest chain at Needle Rock. Combined with fewer rupees being available, Japanese loses 7 minutes to English. This is still a net time save of about 13 minutes, which Kafta takes advantage of to lower the record. Now that Kafta has had his fun, it was Narcissa's turn. Narcissa wasn't afraid to go for the Cabana Deed skip, and it showed. Narcissa sought out whatever strategy was the fastest, no matter how difficult. She worked hard to bring the record down as far as possible. Narcissa had achieved a 5.56.34 on May 16th, less than two weeks after Kafta's run. Narcissa was playing on the English version of the game, so a more apt comparison would be Giano's 6.16. 20 minutes of optimization without the time save from Japanese should be enough to tell you that Narcissa was the real deal. Over the next few months, she would get several more world records, winding up with the 521.08 on July 12, 2012. 
Narcissa was taking this game seriously and made the jump to Japanese to continue saving time. Narcissa would continue her grind throughout the rest of the summer of 2012. After switching versions, Narcissa got a 5.15.45 near the end of July and eventually improved her time down to a 4.58.55 on August 24th. This was the first time Wind Waker had been completed in under five hours. It was only three months prior that the world record was over six hours. Narcissa had turned Wind Waker speedrunning on its head, and there was no going back. Up until this point, runners were using the Forest Water and Forest Haven as their only method of achieving storage. Because Forest Water takes 20 minutes to expire, and because the Forest Haven is out of the way, runners opted to use this trick only when absolutely necessary. It simply wasn't viable to use it for anything other than the Cabana Deed Skip. If runners had a way to get storage more easily, they could break the run wide open. And while that breakthrough would come, it came from an unlikely source. Narcissa received a message from someone named Forgone Moose. Moose was playing around in Wind Waker when they accidentally recreated storage without using forest water. Glitch hunter extraordinaire Ababob started streaming looking into the new glitch. After reverse engineering the message, Ababob had figured out what Forgone Moose had done to get storage without forest water. This is dry storage. By climbing on certain geometry, Link has a short window to pull out the Wind Waker. Because of the shape of the terrain, Link will immediately fall off while holding the Wind Waker, also known as a Wind Waker dive. By putting the Wind Waker away three frames before landing, the game still thinks you're in the Wind Waker performance state. This is the same state you get from forest water storage. The primary benefit is that dry storage can be performed almost anywhere. Now that runners could achieve storage virtually anywhere at any time, they could utilize the benefits more often. As previously mentioned, opening chests drastically alters Link's hitbox and collision. This allows Link to maneuver around normally impassable terrain and virtually up slanted walls. What's more, by pulling out the Wind Waker again, you can lock the camera in front of you as if you're playing the Wind Waker, while being able to move around freely. While it might not seem like locking the camera in front of you is particularly useful, there is one thing that it's good for. While swimming and holding up, Link will start to spin in the water. You may be familiar with the concept of negative speed. The most popular example is backwards long jumps in Super Mario 64. The developers capped Mario's forward speed, but not his backward speed. This meant that if there was a way to build up negative speed, Mario can impose his will upon Peach's castle. And wouldn't you know it, Link's backward speed isn't capped here either. Link loses three units of speed every time he turns around in the water. Because the game doesn't know how to handle swimming backwards with the camera locked in front of Link, the game turns Link around every frame. At full speed, it's possible to build up 90 units of speed per second. When you combine storage, swimming, and negative speed, do you know what you get? Ladies and gentlemen, Super Swimming. Super Swimming lets the player cover huge chunks of the map in a flash. With Super Swimming, it's possible to quickly reach far-off islands, much faster than using the boat. 
Because it's so cumbersome to change the direction of the wind, and because the vast distances required to travel the most places, Super Swims became almost just as utilized as the King of Red Lions himself. In a video game about sailing the high seas, speedrunners skip the boat, as they are wont to do. For months, Narcissa was the reigning champion of Wind Waker. She attracted thousands of viewers as she chipped away at the time. Narcissa was the runner of that time period between 2012 or 2011 even to 20, 2013. She was the one doing the runs. She was the one really pushing the game, really getting the community and motivated to keep moving forward, keep finding new stuff. Narcissa couldn't hog the spotlight forever though. Another speed demon was about to throw caution to the wind. Demon had been another name that popped up in the SRL races in the last couple of months. Demon was taking first place more often than not in his races, and was ready to ply his trade in any percent. On September 9th, 2012, Demon would get a 45802, the first run to incorporate dry storage in super swimming. I gotta say it was pretty exciting, of course, like, it was kind of special because, well, I I mean, I was the underdog, of course, and um, a, a lot of people were against me. So to me, it was kind of to prove myself to be good enough uh, towards Narcissa. And uh, but it was also like really exciting, though. These two optimizations had irrevocably affected the run. Where once Narcissa was the pirate queen of the seven seas, these were uncharted waters. Optimally, these tricks saved about 10 minutes off the bat. Having been discovered less than a week earlier, the bloom was still on the rose. Despite not being a huge improvement over the previous time, Demon was no slouch. Demon and Narcissa were pound for pound the two best Wind Waker speedrunners around. The two were going to go back and forth in lowering the record. While there wasn't much of a rivalry to speak of, both were passionate about the game. They were two ships passing in the night, each going their own way. Narcissa is a master of optimization, squeezing every second out of the run. Demon is a man of execution, every trick landed with ease. The only question is, who can get the most out of this round? Ten months and 13 world records later, the record was set at 4.34.09 by Demon. While the overall route hadn't changed very much, these two were on the cutting edge of new strats to lower the time as far as it could go. But there was just one more trick that the community was looking for that was just out of reach. The Wind Waker was one of the longest Zelda speedruns at this time. The biggest reason for this was because there were no major sequence breaks or skips. While games like Ocarina of Time had tricks that skipped huge portions of the run, the Wind Waker had to be completed practically as intended. But what if there was a way to skip over half the game? In the realm of Hyrule, players could see the end of the game, Ganon's Tower, just a stone's throw away from the castle. The only thing stopping them was none other than the barrier. The barrier was put in place to stop Link from going to the final fight without fully powering up the Master Sword, which required a series of quests that make up the last half of the game. 
if there was only a way to get through it that could skip hours of content, but it wasn't going to be easy. On July 23, 2013, Narcissa posted a video to her YouTube channel titled Barrier Skip 101. In it, she explains why this barrier is giving runners so much trouble. Let me kind of explain how crazy this thing is. This barrier, it goes all the way up, like way the fuck up. Like it goes so high and it's a cylinder encircling the entire castle. Within the cylinder, I'm not taking damage, but anywhere outside of the cylinder, I get infinite knockback. I, I'm forever taking damage and getting pushed back. Also, there's an invisible wall through the barrier, so even if I do a glitch, there's a glitch you can do where you pull the Wind Waker on the same frame that your damage and vulnerability ends. I've canceled taking damage from this hitbox or whatever, like I, I can no longer take damage. And I'm past the, the, the damage part of the barrier, if you look where I'm standing, I'm actually past it. But, check this out, I still can't walk forward even though I'm past the barrier. Now why is that? There's actually an invisible wall in addition to the damage barrier. The invisible wall reaches all the way up. It reaches pretty far down, although it does end. <clears throat> uh, there's a couple other things you have to keep in mind. One thing, this area does not have a map. When I press D-pad up, nothing happens. So I can't use the tingle tuner in here, which means, <clears throat> which means that if I try to do a zombie hover and then heal myself, I can't do that. Uh, also, uh, because of how big this barrier is, if I started on the entire other end of the castle and did a zombie hover and I mashed frame perfectly, I wouldn't even get close to clearing this thing. I would hit the fucking barrier and fall down, even if I mashed frame perfect. Now that we're on this ledge, let's just like ledge clip through the thing. Like, like cancel a knockback and then like ledge clip through the invisible wall. Well, it turns out you can't grab this ledge, so you can't ledge clip. Uh, another thing that was thought of is let's die and then right as Link's about to stand up, get pushed off the ledge by a bomb, fall down and then do a zombie hover under the barrier and then enter the loading zone. And that, you can do that, but because you got knocked back, and then you died, and then you started the zombie hover, you no longer have the glitch I have now where I, I, I don't take any damage from the knockback from the damage barrier. So, even if you do that, you still can't get past the barrier. Therefore, there is no way to cross this barrier and get to Ganon's castle without actually breaking it. The community was at their wit's end. Skipping this barrier would shave off hours from the run, but the wall stood there, taunting any and all challengers who dared pass through. So people were trying to find barrier skip from when I first started watching Wind Waker speedruns in early 2013. It was this thing that we knew would be like a three hour time save. And there were so many different methods that people tried with like zombie hovering, under the barrier, zombie hovering over the barrier, trying to do like this fake death zombie hover. So really none of those worked. And I personally believe that it was never going to happen. At this point in time, speedrunning was still very new to the gaming community at large. As such, there were only a handful of games and runners who had any notoriety at all. But Narcissa and the Wind Waker were household names. Narcissa was drawing in thousands of viewers to her streams. This barrier that stopped Narcissa in her tracks became the most notorious barrier in all of speedrunning history. This wasn't just any barrier, it was THE barrier. Within, like, as far as I could see, the entire collective of the speedrunning community, it was THE barrier skip. It was not A barrier skip, it was THE barrier skip. Right? If you could get past that wall, then you would make a lot of people very excited. But the barrier would have to wait. After throwing everything they had at the barrier, it stood ever stalwart. Demon and Narcissa focused their efforts into the run instead, waiting for the chance to take the barrier down. 
Demon took a look at the route and found a way to squeeze in a super swim to Great Fish Isle. Normally, approaching the island for the first time activates two cutscenes. Storage is only able to skip one of them. If runners weren't fast enough to disable the camera lock before the second cutscene played, the game would be softlocked. With some tricky timing, Demon found a way to make it work. Narcissa would be the first to implement this in a world record run, with a 4.32.26 on January 28, 2013. This super swim had set in motion an explosive series of events, which would lead to another important route change. Back in 2012, Narcissa had theorized a potential new route that would see players get bombs earlier in the game. After beating Dragon Roost Cavern, runners would super swim to Great Fish Isle and start the Pirate Ship at Windfall segment to grab bombs. Getting bombs before going to Forbidden Woods virtually breaks the entire dungeon. Bombs could open doors literally and figuratively. Without needing any items from the dungeon, players can even skip the boss key by clipping through the final door. However, at the time, runners thought that the boomerang would save more time later in the run than it actually did. In July 2013, Zelda Speedrun forum user Matty had actually timed the route and determined that the bomb's early route is indeed faster. With the more consistent way to do the super swim to Great Fish, there were no more reasons to avoid running with this route. With the new game plan at their disposal, Narcissa and Demon throw themselves back into the fray. A little over a month later, Narcissa lowered her time to a 4.31.03 on August 27th. Not long after that, Demon got a 4.28.41 on September 6th. She always felt like she went so fast with everything. Like, it was hard to keep up with her. <laughs> how, how do you describe it? <laughs> Good at the game, like, I, I don't know how to put it. You could think of it like she was able to squeeze those few seconds out out of all the splits, pretty much. Like, that's how it felt. Those seconds that I couldn't find, well, she found those somehow. somehow. Around this time, Maddie also came up with a new route to save time on Dragon Roost Island. Up until now, runners had to sit through the delivery bag cutscene and had to progress the story for a while to obtain a bottle. With this bottle, they could enter Dragon Roost Cavern as intended. But Maddie had the idea to do a super swim to Bomb Island and grab the empty bottle from there and then super swim back. With a zombie hover to the upper floor of the island, players could skip the cutscene and the chatter, saving themselves a minute. On September 12, 2013, Narcissa started up another run of the Wind Waker. This run was supposed to be her last run for a little while. Several months ago, Nintendo announced that the Wind Waker was getting an HD remaster for the Wii U. Narcissa had made her intention known that good, bad, or indifferent, she was going to spend her time playing Wind Waker HD for the foreseeable future. With thousands of eyes watching, Narcissa was ready to deliver what so many people had come to expect from her stream. Like so many runs before it, Narcissa's run starts with Forsaken Fortress and then Dragon Roost Island. After receiving the Wind Waker, Narcissa is off to the races. In the first hour and a half, Narcissa grabs Din's Pearl, Bombs, The Leaf, Feror's Pearl, and then Nehru's. After clearing the Tower of the Gods, it's time to visit Hyrule Castle. After grabbing the Master Sword, the run enters the Back Nine. Narcissa is quick to complete Earth and Wind Temple in short order, followed by an hour of sailing the high seas for charts and Triforce shards. Finally, it's time for the gauntlet. Entering Ganon's tower, she instantly skips the first challenge, the Four Trials. Next up, she goes through Phantom Ganon's maze to grab the light arrows. On to Puppet Ganon. During this fight, Narcissa snipes the blue orb on the puppet's tail, ignoring the developer's intentions of cutting the puppet's ropes. With a practiced hand, she takes out all three phases with ease. All that stands in her way of glory is the final fight. The intense rooftop battle goes off without a hitch, and Narcissa brings it home. The final time, 4.27.53. Why is this run so special? While the run was a solid world record, it also wasn't groundbreaking. Just another step in the endless march of progress. It didn't shatter anyone's high expectations. So why is this run so significant? 
While nobody knew it at the time, this was Narcissa's final run of Wind Waker. Ultimately, she decided to chart a new course and focus more of her time and energy on HD. Following the release of the remake, this run would be left to stand unchallenged for a few months. But nothing gold can stay. Demon was ready to get back to the grind. He would lower the record to 425.54 on December 5th, 2013. Without Narcissa's competition, Demon was content with his run and set his sights on other Zelda games like Ocarina of Time. Narcissa and Demon had been active in running the game for years, and their expertise showed in their gameplay. It was the defining feature that let them shine brighter than the rest. In fact, Demon was so good at performing storage on the first try that the community came up with a name for it, Swedish Storage. These two were legends. But these legends had inspired others to join in on the fun as well. Starting in 2013, dozens of runners had joined the scene, and by now, the best of those runners had been running the game for over a year. In the same way that Demon and Narcissa had put the time in to master the game, so too had these up-and-comers. All those new people who had joined in, you know, sort of early mid 2013 have out have now all been playing for a while. Uh, and so I guess the people who had been playing the most or the people who had been practicing the most from that bunch are now are now very close to the top level. So pretty much after the HD version was released, Demon didn't have as much competition at first because Narcissa was no longer doing runs. So I think for him, that was sort of an excuse to take at least a little bit of a break. And that did give some other runners an opportunity to try to get the record. In April of 2014, one of these newer runners finally mounted the summit. Kolja had a new trick at his disposal. The Japanese version of the game had one major difference from its English counterpart. This version had a slightly different part of the Triforce hunt that was altered in later releases. Essentially, the golden ship at Needle Rock held three treasure charts instead of the Triforce piece in later editions. This was the Japanese version's most obvious flaw, as it lost seven minutes of time to the English version of the game. Runners had been leaving these three charts for the end of the Triforce segment, but runners realized they could grab these charts much earlier and work them into the round. This reduced the amount of time required to complete this Triforce piece by a few minutes, but it also added in a pretty tough super swim. Kolja became the first person outside of Narcissa and Demon to have the record since Calf Dunn 2012. Kolja would lay claim to the record with a time of 4.24.15. The four-month absence from Demon had left an opening. This new challenger would reignite Demon's passion. By the end of April, Demon had lowered his time to 4.2302. Kolja had stuck his head in the lion's mouth, and Demon had decided his break was over. No, 4.22. Fuck this run. <laughs> wow, this run was bad. It was time for yet another route shakeup. Instead of getting the pearls in order, a new route was proposed that saw runners getting bombs immediately after getting the Wind Waker. From there, a zombie hover up the side of Forest Haven would allow them to grab the Deku Leaf without the grappling hook. Now runners could finish Forbidden Woods, get Nehru's pearl from the Great Fish, and then make their way back to Dragon Roost. With the leaf in their possession, runners didn't even need a bottle to enter the cavern, cutting out that detour from the Route 2. This Deku Leaf early route easily saved another three minutes or so. Getting the Deku Leaf early was a game changer. Demon would take the next few months to do runs, highlighted by a 421.21 on June 9th and a 421 flat on July 21st. Alongside Kolja, another one of these up and coming runners was Gymnast86. Having closed the gap over the last few months, this route shakeup was the perfect opportunity for Jim to sneak in a world record of his own. Striking while the iron is hot, Gymnast fires up the forge. In a run that started good and never let up off the throttle, Jim found himself with the final time of 4.20.10. 4.20? Nice. But seriously, this was a ridiculously great effort from Gymnast, an 8 minute PB. 
It was so hype that Jim found himself the recipient of his very own tribute video. This is to bless Jim's urn. Let's do it. Oh boy, here we go. Oh boy. Jim's time in the spotlight would be short-lived, but that was okay. Jim had achieved what he set out to do. On the horizon, a new trick was about to be implemented into the run that would render his time obsolete. Routers Woofer ZFG and Cries investigated why Super Swim seemed so inconsistent. One of the problems with Super Swimming was that runners could set up a Super Swim only for it to drastically lose speed right out of the gate. This would result in major time losses, and even the potential for Link to drown because he couldn't make it to the destination fast enough. This phenomenon happened roughly one-fifth of the time, and severely hampered Runner's ability to complete runs consistently. The two got to work to better understand what was happening. Because Link's movement speed fluctuates during the swimming animation, super swim speeds could be either really fast or really slow depending on when runners release their backwards momentum. Armed with this new understanding, Woofer and Cries let the rest of the community in on what was happening, and developed a method of pause buffering to better control this exploit. Woofer ZFG, same clever man who came up with uh, the Leaf Early route, managed to figure out that super swims could actually sort of be predicted, as far as your speed goes, based on whatever Link's animation was in the water. So Woofer's strategy was to watch like how high or low Link's head was in the water uh, on the frames that you were considering uh, like releasing your super swim out across the ocean. And so using that, we were actually able to start getting much more consistent super swims, especially the ones that were considered long distance, like, you know, two and a half to three quadrants across the ocean. Uh, those super swims became a lot more consistent because beforehand it was just like, all right, well, you charged up your super swim, you aim in the right direction, and you just kind of prayed that you got good speed when you released. It's, you know, one of those really, it's a pretty small thing, but the consistency that it adds to the run was able to make times come down a lot quicker than they otherwise normally would have been able to do. Utilizing super swim buffering, Demon would get a time of 4.17.42 on August 5th. To put it lightly, Demon blew Jim out of the water. Unfortunately, there were no half-naked men backflipping for Demon's triumphs. I'm sure this isn't the last we'll see of Jim. After reclaiming his record, Demon took another break. Demon just thrives off of competition, and every single time that his record's taken, he has come roaring back and <laughs> immediately gotten it back and also just started playing the game more. Every single time that there's been another runner who has challenged him, Demon has come back very quickly just because he can. He stayed at top level for years, and he's just motivated to do that. This created another opening for someone to climb the ladder and make themselves famous. Japanese runner SVA had decided to make a run for it. SVA is well known for his exploits in other Zelda games, such as Ocarina of Time and Skyward Sword. A well-credentialed runner, SVA would get two world records in October. On October 21st, SVA got a time of 4.16.34. This was another example of Demon getting a run featuring a new piece of tech, and then taking a step away from the game. Demon could lose the world record if his run was not optimized now. Runners were closing the skill gap, and while SVA is no slouch, Demon was in a league of his own. A week to the day later, 
Demon got a 4.13.18. That's an improvement of more than three minutes. SVA would get back to work and found himself in position to compete for the world record once again. Eventually, he hit pay dirt. On November 24th, SVA got a 4.13.07, an 11 second improvement. While runners like Kolja, Gymnast, and SVA could compete for the world record in ideal conditions, there was no real competition for Demon. Opportunities would present themselves, and a day and time runner would rise to the occasion, only to be completely outdone by Demon. Demon was the reigning king of Wind Waker, and as we all know, the only thing that trumps a king? An ace. On December 8th, a new runner, Chaotic Ace, got a time of 4.12.57. Having been running for almost a year at this point, Ace had quickly risen through the ranks. But unlike the challengers before him, Ace didn't intend on being a one-hit wonder. Demon fired back the very next day with a 4.11.46. Alright, a gold. Ice. Nice. Okay then. It happened. <laughs> I am sorry, Ace. And eventually a 409.42 to cap off 2014. With no major route changes to speak of, the name of the game was now Optimization. Demon had gotten by on his sweetest storage and surgical execution, but Ace was a master of optimization. He had a beautiful eye for where every single second could be squeezed. Yeah, Ace was a lot more motivated and competitive. Uh, Ace, I'm, I'm pretty sure Ace went through and like completely modernized like a lot of the, a lot of the tiny strategies that happened. Like, you know, how we would defeat certain types of enemies in certain places. Uh, you know, like what the specific movement sequences should be when going through like different temples while we had chest storage. And that kind of stuff because i like i specifically remember like watching uh like one of the runs that ace was doing just thinking like what the heck like like where did all these strategies come from <laughs> like i haven't seen any of these before so like it was it was that and just i'm pretty sure he like he practiced a lot he's one of those guys that if he doesn't like how something's going to work he's going to figure out a way that he likes to do it and i think he really had the right mentality of how do i how can i push this game to as far of a degree as possible without driving me insane. And I think he really succeeded in that. I mean, he, man, he was just, he was on the grind. He was really pushing what it meant to be optimal in this game. Ace, I think, was the first runner who could actually compete with Demon long-term since Narcissa. And Ace was just really, really good at the game. And I think he had just as much of a drive to optimize the game to its full potential that Demon did. The stage was set for 2015. Ace and Demon were going to go back and forth for the record. There was no beef on this proverbial grill. The two would frequently share notes and ideas. The free transmission of information made what followed even more of a spectacle. Sub 4 was an earshot but these two sleuthy sailors had work to do. Nice. It's the goal to finish. 408-22, the new record.
All right, <laughs> a new PV, finally a good game. <laughs> About time. New. Uh, I feel like he came into the game very quickly and he got extremely good. He was very hard to compete against. He kept doing some strats that weren't just super fast. <laughs> he, I don't know, it, it was it, it was hard to keep up with him, I felt like. I, I guess I still did it, but he was really good. I felt, I remember back then that Ace is definitely gonna get his first sub 4. This guy is good. What was once a far-off island on the other end of the looking glass was now clear and in focus. Sub, four hours. Narcissa had been the one to push through the previous two hour barriers. Where once there was a speedrun rife with time save opportunity, things were beginning to tighten up. Who was going to be the one to break through what would probably be the final hour barrier? While Ace had held the title for most of 2015, Demon was making a resurgence. Almost three years after first joining the community, Demon was in arm's reach of the next big milestone. Starting out, Demon gets a clean early game, saving himself chunks of time compared to his last PB. By the time he's entering Dragon Roost Cavern, he's almost two minutes ahead. If it was easy to hold on to this time, he could coast through the rest of the game with a sub 4 in the bag. Unfortunately, Demon struggles on the Tower of the Gods boss fight and loses a good portion of his lead. After grabbing the Master Sword in Hyrule, he's sitting just one minute ahead of his previous best. Demon is not deterred, however, as there's plenty of work to be done in the second half. While his time ebbs and flows, Demon is maintaining a pretty solid lead. That is, until the Wind Temple. Demon misses the crucial quick kill on the Wind Temple boss, twice. Failing to grab the boss's weak point meant Demon had to wait through two more cycles, losing him all of the lead that he had left. Still, Demon wasn't ready to give up. It was time to rally. Pulling out all the stops, Demon gets two gold splits while collecting the treasure charts. With some solid gameplay on the Triforce collecting, Demon finds himself back to being one minute ahead, going into Hyrule for the last time. This was it, the final stretch. After grabbing the light arrows, it's down to the last few fights. With trembling hands, Demon's adrenaline is spiking. He's done this fight a hundred times before, all he has to do is clutch it out. All three phases of Puppet Ganon are down in no time, and Demon is still gaining time on his last run. It all comes down to Ganon. After rehearsing the fight in his mind, Demon pulls it out and plunges the Master Sword into Ganon's head. It's done. It is done. Fuck. <laughs> Rip control. It is done. It's done. It's done. It's fucking done. It's done. Oh, it's my control. <laughs> Oh my god. Demon would be the first one to achieve a sub 4 hour time, a 3.59.51, on September 7th, 2015. This run wasn't perfect, but Demon was happy. This had been his goal for a while now, and with this achievement, he could breathe easy. In the aftermath of the run, Demon says, I don't care if Ace beats this, it's sub 4. That's what I wanted. Demon was ready to take a well-deserved break. Ace would be left to carry the water on his own. As you play more, the more consistent you become, the less time there is to save. But also, as you get better, you become more consistent and you realize how much better you can do certain things. So there were many times where I would, let's say, get a best segment somewhere. And then I'd realize, wait, hang on, I missed storage twice during that segment. I can still beat that segment by another four seconds. And then I get another segment that didn't miss storage at all. I save those four seconds, and then I realize, wait, I had four extra buffers during these super swims. I can save another two seconds. So that type of thing would happen constantly. Um, and then even after you save that time, you still oftentimes realize you can still squeeze another second or two out here and there. Ace would, in fact, take back the world record less than a month later with a 359.43 on October 2nd. 
Ace would improve the record several more times in the next few months, highlighted by a 357-59 in November and a 355-44 in April 2016. It was around this time that Ace decided to hang it up. The previous 16 months had taken their toll, and Ace was ready to tag out. But before he left, Ace had left the community with a parting gift. Around this time, Ace had found a way to clip into a wall by dropping a bomb behind him. When you're standing against a wall and drop a bomb, Link is pushed forwards. When Link moves forward, he's pushed with enough speed that you can clip into things. Ace had found a way to be pushed into a wall in Diamond Step Island, which allowed him to then hookshot over to the chart chest. This saved time on this island for sure, but Glitch Hunter and Tasser Trog dared to dream bigger. At the time it was found, Trog had decided to test if it was possible to clip through the barrier using a bomb push clip. As it turns out, Trog is pretty damn good at this whole glitch hunting thing. After trying various scripts and brute force methods, he just couldn't push himself through the wall. Trog's reputation was so great that the community resigned hope. If Trog can't find it, it doesn't exist. This effectively stomped out what could have been another lead on Barrier Skip. Speaking of barriers being skipped, let's check in with Wind Waker HD. HD found itself in an interesting position. It was not quite as fast as the original Wind Waker, due to missing some of the key glitches found in the original. Chief among those was HD was unable to perform storage. This led to a more glitchless, straightforward run. In June of 2016, HD would find a glitch exclusive to their version, called Item Sliding. What is item sliding? In most Zelda games, there's something called ESS position. These are the smallest positions on the analog stick that register in the game. While moving in a direction while also holding a first person item, you would pause and move the analog stick to the opposite side to the ESS position, granting Link a crazy amount of speed in the original direction. Item sliding was originally found by Gertana and later figured out by Sus Lady. Instantly, HD had a super swim of its own with an entirely different method. While super swimming is bound to the water, item sliding can be performed on land. But even with item sliding, you just can't zip through the barrier. Or so they thought. In the early hours of August 17th, Gertana posted a video. A wild claim to have achieved the elusive barrier skip. Barrier skip has been found. It is August 16th, um... I, I just hope that people like believe me on this. This is not a joke. You can see an indents right there. You can clip through that. That's how I got through. The community had heard this story before. Gertana was not recording and only posted a video of himself on the other side of the barrier. Gertana had been the one to find item sliding, so this claim carried with it a little more intrigue. Runners were cautious though. Barrier Skip had attracted lots of attention over the years, and it was not uncommon for fake or joke videos to be posted. After a few different people had spent several hours trying to replicate the glitch, Gertana's video was dismissed as being a bad joke from a teenager. However, one person didn't quit looking. That person was Link Oscuro. With the foresight to actually record his efforts, Oscuro had listened to Gertana and tried to replicate what he had alleged to have done. After some time, Oscuro had finally done it. Oscuro had tested and proven that Gertana was right. They had found the holy grail of speedrunning. They had found Barrier Skip. What? Guys, I did it! 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 I did Barry Skip! Woohoohoo! Get it! <laughs> I'm so good at this game, man. <laughs> I did it! By doing item sliding and holding a particular angle, they were able to make their way and slip right through the barrier. It works because the solid wall on the other side of the damage barrier is actually formed by a bunch of different walls that form to make a cylinder. On the bridge, two different walls meet to form a small indent. These walls do not overlap, which means that there is the ever so slightest space between them. Because of the way collision detection works, the game looks to see if Link can move in a direction based on his speed and if he has a clear line of sight. 
Due to how small the crack between the two walls is, the angle required to pass through them is incredibly precise. This is why it had never been found prior to being found by accident. Not only did they need to find the precise angle to slip through the crack, they needed item sliding to give them enough speed to pass through the barrier on one frame. This was it. The game's most elusive skip had been found. The community erupted. The most infamous barrier in all of speedrun history had fallen. Well, not for everyone. While the original game had the crack in the wall, there was no way to perform item sliding. This meant they could not build up enough speed to get through the wall. For Wind Waker, the barrier remained ever present. On the other hand, HD was learning that you should be careful what you wish for. Like a dog chasing cars, the community did not have a plan for what they would do if they ever got barrier skip. In a monkey's paw scenario, the game became impossibly inconsistent, run into the ground by RNG. If you were trying to contend for the world record, your run had a 5% chance of finishing. Normally, runners need items like the bow and the light arrows to defeat Puppet Ganon, and the hookshot to make it to the roof. Runners could zombie hover to the top, but had no way to heal themselves. That left runners at the mercy of fairy hovers. These blue pots contained fairies that could heal you, but in order for you to grab them and make it to the platform, you have to wait for them to fly away. Fairies can go virtually anywhere and are impossible to anticipate. This meant most runners could not finish a run with first try fairy hover. A fate worse than death. But that's a story for another time. While all of this is particularly awful, this is HD's problem. While most runners had set their attention on HD, something had been found in Wind Waker that was enough to bring Demon back into the fold. No, it's not Barrier Skip. It had been known for a while that you could start a super swim without storage by pause buffering every input. Though the pause buffering is slow and tedious, it allowed runners to get off of Outside Island without the Wind Waker. Not many runners were excited to implement this into the run, but one of them was Demon. Demon had been playing other games like Twilight Princess for the better part of two years, but he was ready to come back and push the game further with a little help from manual super swims. Even though the manual super swim wasn't a fun addition to the run, Demon was happy to be playing Wind Waker again. Starting on January 28, 2018, Demon got a 355-24. Ace's 355-44 had stood for almost two years. It felt good to have a top runner playing the game again. By the end of April, Demon had lowered his time to a 351-38. After a few runs, Demon knew a sub-350 was around the corner. Around the beginning of July, he had achieved that goal with a 348.17. That was super dumb. Oh well, fuck it. I have time saved for my next run. <laughs> That's super dumb. Ah. Oh. Ah. Oh. <laughs> 348. We have the sub 350. Even with the choke in them. Kinda. After meeting this new goal, Demon was ready to move on again. And with him, he took any chance of the top time going down. A confluence of circumstances had led to a period of inactivity. Like the ebb and flow of the tides, runners who ran other Zelda games went where the optimizations were. It's not an exaggeration, this category died a death. After Ace's departure, Demon was all that remained. And after Demon left, you could hear a pin drop. People were on the periphery, glitch hunting, fact finding, and theory testing, but nobody was pushing the game. Without runners like Ace, Demon, or even runner-up Chastifer, there was nobody left to move the needle. This would be the way things were for over a year. In June of 2019, a runner named R3D posted a picture to Discord that showed an arrow stuck in Link's hand, a humorous visual glitch that seemed innocent enough. 
community member Legend of Link decided to take a deeper look into it. While this glitch doesn't look like much, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Legend of Link was able to recreate the glitch and found that by doing the trick multiple times, the arrows were being duplicated. Every time that Link pulls out the arrow, the arrow is taking up space in the game's memory. Normally, arrows would despawn after a short time, but because they're pulled out with this method, they're never unloaded. If performed enough times, the onslaught of arrows would choke out the console's resources. For a while, the community knew that certain assets wouldn't load if memory was low. After performing this trick a number of times, runners determined that this was a quick and viable way to exhaust memory. Which brings us back to the barrier. Runners couldn't zombie hover over the top of it. Frame-perfect zombie hovers from end zone to end zone would not let Link clear the uprights. Runners couldn't get through because they didn't have a way to get enough speed, like with item sliding. Runners couldn't go under it because they'd void out and respawn. Runners couldn't go around the barrier because it surrounded the entire castle. Even with its minuscule crevices, there was no way to circumvent the barrier. So what if the barrier just wasn't there? What if runners could stop the barrier from loading in the first place? Dragonbane got to work testing this theory. Dragonbane had previously tried to unload the barrier as far back as 2016, but there wasn't a good way to fill up memory at the time. Maybe this time would be different though. Just a few days after Legend of Link had recreated the arrow duping glitch, Dragonbane had done it. Dragonbane had found Barrier Skip for the Wind Waker. The next few days were a scramble. Tons of community members came out to try and find a setup that had some semblance of consistency, while also not flat out crashing the game. Anytime memory manipulation is at play, there's a decent chance that one wrong move could seize up the game. With the actor in loading, you could do it perfectly and it still could just like not work just because, you know, the game's dumb. And like maybe like like small things such as like like footprints on the ground when you're wet coming out of the water, that like even stuff as small as that could mess it up and you'd never know until you get there. So it was super annoying. So a lot of times you'd get there and actor in loading and it's like, wow, it didn't work. Or like even if it like does look like it works, you'd have to reload the room over and over again until the barrier is gone. And that could that could have taken one try, could have taken ten tries, like who knows. Like the siren song that called so many sailors to the sea, speedrunners were returning to the fold and putting their boat in the water. This was a time of controlled chaos and daily innovation. Whatever followed in the wake of Barrier Skip was not going to be elegant. It wasn't going to be perfect, or optimized, or impregnable. But it would be the first run to have Barrier Skip. Gymnast was one of those runners who raised his flag and set sail. After spending most of the last year with his head in the clouds, Jim was ready to put down Skyward Sword for a little while. From the outset, things seemed like business as usual. A manual super swim here, some early bombs over there, a routine voyage if ever there was one. Once Jim gets the bow, however, things start to go off the rails. In a split named Count to 600, Jim stands on Dragon Roost Island and begins counting to 600. That's not hyperbole, by the way. All right, everyone, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, nine, ninety. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, six hundred. We did it. After doing the arrow duplication 75 times, Jim has to pull out the grappling hook 600 times in order to fill the game's memory. When you get to a certain point in exhausting memory, the game will not let you pull out the grappling hook. However, the game still allocates memory for the item, even though it cannot be used. After attempting to whip it out for the better part of 5 minutes, Jim moves on to Forsaken Fortress to do it another 200 times. But just then, disaster strikes. Here, which is kind of stupid. What? My A press. Oh well. After a zombie hover gone awry, Jim unexpectedly dies, which means he must return to Dragon Roost Isle and start again at the beginning. After dispensing with the Helmarok King, Jim makes his way to Hyrule. After firing off arrows into the void and faffing around with the grappling hook some more for 40 minutes, 
Jim receives the ultimate reward. Now you might be wondering, does this mean that Gymnast is going to have to do a fairy hover to get to the final battle? Well, since Wind Waker HD has had to deal with it for so long now, the community had found more consistent methods of making that jump, with the help of these little spiky enemies. These little black and orange urchins are the key to consistent hovers. Essentially, these enemies, called Morths, are capable of dropping hearts, but only when killed with a sword. However, with precise spacing, it's possible to stab these Morths on the same frame that they attach to Link. After rolling to dislodge them, Link can blow the Morths away with a leaf, pushing them up to the ledge above. Now when they're killed, they'll drop hearts, meaning runners can guarantee their hover will succeed. After fiddling with the Morths for a few minutes, Jim makes it to the ledge and heads to the roof. Jim goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ganon. Careful not to drop this opportunity, he deftly dispenses this dastardly devil. After almost five years since his last run, he finally tasted that victory once again. Jim completed the very first run of the original Wind Waker with Barrier Skip in 3 hours, 29 minutes, and 10 seconds on July 12th, 2019. Oh, fast light arrow shot, excellent. Three twenty nine ten. The Wind Waker has been completed with Barrier Skip. While Jim's run was the first run with Barrier Skip, others were working on faster ways to go about it. The workings of a faster route were coming together, but would take a few days to coalesce. In the meantime, Jim had died during his run and had to start over. This opening allowed Mini Mini 352 to take the world record just two days later. By following the route performed in Jim's run, but without dying, Mini found himself at the top of Wind Waker speedrunning, for a little less than a day. At this point, runners had been duplicating arrows in order to get to the point where the game failed to load the grappling hook. But a new route sought to get to that point faster, without the bow. In Forest Haven, there are a bunch of floating particles and a choo-choo cutscene. Because of these things, the game's memory is already close to the point where you cannot pull out the grappling hook. By bonking off the Deku Tree, it will play the cutscene of the choo-choos falling off its face, which takes up memory, allowing runners to quickly reach the point of grapple hook exhaustion. Put simply, this meant that runners didn't have to count to 800. I would say that I was probably one of the people who tried it the most, in a way. Because I actually spent like a month on it, almost 10 hours per day some days. I really wanted to get it to work. Some people didn't find it to be too cool, I guess, because it's actor unloading was really annoying in itself. I was kind of one of those. I didn't like it too much because it seemed kind of annoying and really stupid in how it works. But like I said, <laughs> like I said, I, I tried to put a lot of time into it to make it better at least. Using this new method of actor unloading, Demon would lower the world record down to 2 hours and 30 seconds on July 15th. <laughs> I didn't get the option to fucking jump on his head. <laughs> oh, Alright, GG. I only lost like 25 minutes in the end. Two hours and 30 seconds. Any percent is dead. Obviously. Demon's skill at Wind Waker was undeniable, but the run was vastly different now. It wasn't just about execution anymore. A few runners noticed that some setups didn't work on their consoles. Memory exhaustion strategies would sometimes have to be unique to a runner's own machine. Runners found themselves at the mercy of their console's hardware. Due to the nature of memory manipulation and speedruns, the run had become much more volatile. Even something as small as the footprints on the sand could throw off the very fragile memory manipulation the runners were building towards. With so many pitfalls ready to trip up unsuspecting runners, runs became harder to finish. Jim returned and got a better time with a new and improved route. 
Jim wound up with a 148.38 on July 21st, nearly a 12-minute improvement. He unfortunately did not receive a tribute video of a man doing flips for this record, though. Demon continued improving, and throughout the end of July to the beginning of August, would rattle off a few PBs of his own. Starting with a 139.19 on July 26 and ending with a 114.14 on August 3rd. Like sharks drawn to a droplet of blood, so too are speedrunners drawn when new time saving glitches are found. And who could blame them? The original Wind Waker finally had Barrier Skip. Discovery breeds intrigue, and this time would be landmarked with an influx of new runners climbing to the top of the leaderboard. Aloha Kirby and Linka 7 were some of the ones that stood out. Aloha Kirby had been playing Wind Waker for a little while now. Before the discovery of Barrier Skip, Kirby had a 359.53. Kirby was the fourth person to get a sub 4 hour time. Linkus had done a few runs of Wind Waker in 2015, but is primarily known for his numerous accomplishments in Wind Waker HD. Both were runners who were up to the challenge, and both were going to make their presence known. Near the end of August, Aloha Kirby would get a 113.42 and a 110.23. In the first few weeks of September, Linkus would get a 109.31 and a 107.50. After nearly a year of laying dormant, the game had been revived by new glitches, strats, routes, and runners. Demon would improve the world record a few times before Linkus would cap off the year with a 104.50 on December 15th. Wind Waker, any percent is dead. That's it. I'm done. That's it. I skipped the 105. I'm a legend. That's it. It's over. Bam. The double. Body armor. You already know I was getting there on the perfect line. There had never been another six month span in the game's history with this many new world records. While the run had received a well needed push from actor unloading barrier skip, a new strategy was about to be discovered with the bang. Earlier, we mentioned that Trog had attempted to find a way to bomb push Clip through the barrier. Despite his lack of success, Bowser is bored decided to take another look. Having spent a lot of time studying Barrier Skip for HD, Bowser thought maybe the gap is just really small and the angle is really precise. Such had been the case for the gap that made item sliding through it possible in HD so it was well within the realm of possibility. By using scripts and cheats to make it easier to test, Bowser set out to find the missing link. After a few false starts and plenty of negative tests, he finally found the hidden thread and unraveled the whole thing. Finally, Bowser was able to find the exact angle and the exact frame that it worked. Everything involved in pushing Link through the wall was so precise, Trog had just barely missed it. The bomb, pu the bomb push looks simple, but it's like complicated, but like, wow, the, the solution was always that. And we never knew, because I'm pretty sure that Trog tried that, but he, the script he ran was like 0.2 speed less than what, what it needed to be, so it didn't work. And that was like three years later, uh, earlier or something. Yeah, so you need like, you need the right position, you need the right angle, and you need the right animation frame. Like those three things need to be perfect for it to even work. Because like apparently like when he, when like, Link pulls a bomb, he goes through this animation cycle, and like you need a specific frame of that cycle in combination with the perfect position and the perfect angle. That's like, wow. It didn't take long before Gymnast came up with a setup that was pretty consistent. In a single moment, an entire community rejoiced. They would no longer have to deal with actor unloading and memory exhaustion. The community had done it. After thousands of hours of collective searching, a clean and elegant method of skipping the barrier was discovered. Yes, thankfully, we, we find we find a, we we find something that does not impede the accessibility of the game even more. But bomb push barrier skip does help with that, uh, and then also helps make the route you know not stupid, and just makes the game a lot more consistent to get through and a little bit faster. It should be of little surprise to you at this point that Demon returned to cash in on the new technique. 
Because it didn't require setting up the memory exhaustion, this saved several minutes over the actor unloading round. On February 5th, 2020, Demon would get a time of 103.14. He would improve his time a few days later to a 101.12. The next day, Linkus took the record with a 1 hour and 50 second time. On February 15th, Demon got a time of 1 hour and 32 seconds. It was clear that the sub hour was within sight. It was not a matter of if, it was a matter of when. Of people who were currently running the game, there was a gap forming. This left Demon and Linkus as the two most likely candidates. Who was it going to be? The King of SD or the King of HD? Demon, as he had done many times previously, would be the first to break through another hour barrier. On February 21st, Demon got a 59.43. This was the culmination of years of hard work and practice. Demon had held his own against Narcissa, Gymnast, Ace, Aloha Kirby, and Linkus. This had been his baby for the last eight years, but even he didn't have the drive to continue. When Demon looked upon the breadth of his Wind Waker accomplishments, he wept, for there were no more kingdoms to conquer. If there was ever an Alexander the Great in speedrunning, it'd be Demon. That's for damn sure. Speedrun retirements are hardly ever a lock. Demon still speedruns, and world record history videos do inspire people to come out of retirement. But for now, Demon is out of the picture. There was light at the end of the tunnel, though. The community had no strings to hold them down. Runners had known for a long time that you could skip getting the light arrows. This didn't seem to be particularly useful, because you still needed light arrows to defeat Puppet Ganon. If you could skip getting the light arrows, you could skip getting the bow, which meant runners only needed to collect bombs and the Deku Leaf before heading to fight Ganon. By getting storage in the first room you see Phantom Ganon, you can unload one of the doors. This lets runners get out of bounds, and they can use the Deku Leaf to get past the brick wall which prevents progression. Skipping the light arrows would skip the Phantom Ganon fight, which saved about two minutes. Next, in the large staircase room, runners could void out of bounds at the same time they hit the loading zone. The setup for this is a bit extensive and very precise, but the reward is worth it. By entering the room this way, they skip the cutscene and Puppet Ganon doesn't spawn in, which means you don't have to have the light arrows. However, this also means the rope from the top of the room doesn't drop. In order to get to the top of the room, runners have to do an incredibly long zombie hover to reach the top. Once in the larger platform up there, players have to drop bombs in precise places while hovering to blow themselves up and change their angle, and continue the zombie hover. Finally, after blowing up the blue pots with fairies in them, they can grab the health and move around. From there, they can perform the Morth Hover, and then go to the final Ganon fight. Previously considered tasks only, this trick is incredibly difficult, and it's only a few minutes before the very end of the run. A tale as old as time, be careful what you wish for. Runners longed for a way to skip the barrier, and now that time has finally come. Congratulations, the run is now infinitely more difficult. Most competition had decided their energy would be better focused elsewhere. This left the game to be run by only a handful of runners. On March 26th, runner Ian Miles got a 59.32. Okay, not it. A... Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh my god, I got it, dude. Oh, fucking shits. Oh, I'm shaking. <laughs> I can't believe I got that. Oh my god, I'm shaking. Three PBs in one day. Oh my god. <laughs> this was the first record with Light Arrow Skip and Puppet Ganon Skip. There were only a handful of runners who were willing to do attempts, and even fewer who were able to do it fast enough to be on world record pace. Aloha Kirby, who held the world record 11 months prior, spent the next few months doing attempts. Starting with a 57.19 in the middle of April, and finishing with a 55.15 in the middle of July. Not too long after Kirby's 55.15, a new name would take the record for themselves. Iwabi, a Japanese speedrunner with a diverse collection of speed games, had started speedrunning the Wind Waker as early as 2015. 
Competing in a number of categories over the years, Awabi was a capable runner who was up to the challenge that any percent offered. On July 18th, Awabi got a time of 54.31. There was only one thing left to implement, a trick so foul that few would dream of attempting it in an RTA run. Awabi was ready to try unbuffered manual super swim. Since 2018, runners had been doing the super swim from Outset Island to Dragon Roost all on their own, using about 100 pause buffers. But this wasn't the only way. Flicking the stick on your own normally wasn't a viable option, because after a certain point, it became too hard to control the super swim. Imperfect movements meant losing a ton of speed. But that speed loss could be mitigated if the control stick was resting in the ESS position. By holding the analog stick in the ESS position when the console powers on, it sets that position to be its neutral point, its absolute zero. Releasing the stick to its actual neutral position would show up in the game as an input. Using this, Awabi could reset his neutral position to ESS, meaning that he didn't have to be perfect with the stick mashing, as he didn't lose as much speed. Unbuffered manual super swim was usually reserved for TAS-only situations, but by raising the floor with this method, Awabi could just barely do this trick physically. That's a long-winded way to say that Awabi had no more excuses. He had to mash his heart out to save more time, but he was ready. It had been two months since his last PB. Awabi couldn't resist another two-minute time save. No matter how tough this was going to be, he had to go for it. With an impressive display of dexterity, Iwabi does the unbuffered super swim to leave Outset Island and grabs the Wind Waker, saving minutes off the buffered version used in the runs before. After Forsaken Fortress, it's time to get to work. First, a super swim to Great Fish Isle, but Iwabi voids out as soon as he arrives, skipping the cutscene. Next, he does another manual super swim back to Windfall Island to the bombs. With only one more item on his shopping list, he makes a beeline straight for Forest Haven to grab the leaf. With all of the ingredients he needs to whip up a world record, it's time to clip into Forsaken Fortress again to warp to Hyrule. In just over 37 minutes, Awabi is face to face with the barrier. In Ganon's tower, Awabi sets up storage on the stone sign and then unloads the door, giving him free access to float to the next exit. Next, with the precise setup fit for a parkour montage, Awabi is in position to skip the Puppet Ganon cutscene and the fight altogether. The frame buffer is tight, but Awabi pulls it off like a champ. Now all that's left is to make it to the roof for the final fight. It's a long zombie hover to the top, but Awabi is rock solid. Using bombs to change his direction, Awabi successfully floats from the bottom floor all the way to the fairy pots and heals himself. All that's left is the Morth Hover to make it to the exit. It's time for the final battle. Awabi had his splits turned off up until now, but now's his chance to sneak a peek. A minute 27 ahead of world record. If he can hold it together, this one's gonna be a monster. If anyone can do it, it's Awabi. A record 15 years in the making. Thousands of man hours are coming together in this moment. On September 16th, 2020, Awabi planted his flag on the Wind Waker, 5308. In the aftermath, Awabi posted that this was the end of the road for him as well. Unbuffered Super Swim was just too much. If this is the future of Wind Waker any percent, he would not be having any more part of it. As of the release of this video, Awabi and Aloha Kirby are the only runners to have finished a run with the Unbuffered Super Swim. So where do we go from here? The run is pretty difficult at this point, and while there's some time to be saved, you're gonna have a hard time trying to save it. A new challenger might breathe new life into the category, but it's not clear who that person might be. There are people who can't help but wonder if barrier skip could be performed even faster. One idea involves Tetra pushing Link through the barrier. There's also the untapped potential of reincorporating actor unloading into the run. It remains to be seen what a route or run might look like if they did, but it would have a few interesting applications. Our ship is pulling into port. What started off as one of the most insanely popular speedruns of its day has been reduced to a shell of its former self. Highlighted by the most sought after skips in all of speedrunning, the game had its ups and downs. Like the pushing and pulling of the tide, the community rode out every storm. 
a more motley crew who cares about their game you may never find. As long as there is wind in their sails, the community will never abandon the Wind Waker. Hey, thanks for watching our video. If you want to join the community, check out our Discord. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps. Thanks.